بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي وسلم على من بعث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين وبعد Dear brothers and respected sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our uh, sitting here and our get together here in his house uh, trying to understand uh, his own speech and sitting for his sake a beautiful hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recorded and narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu recorded by Alimah Muslim in his sahih it's a lengthy hadith but part of the hadith the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says وَمَجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ بَيْنَهُمْ إِلَّا نَزَلَتَ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّكِينَةِ وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa says that there isn't a group of individuals, a group of people who gather in any house out of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in any masjid. Why do they gather? Yatluna kitab Allah. To read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an. وَتَدَارَسُونَهُ بَيْنَهُمْ And to understand the Qur'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To understand the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like we have gathered here. Except that إِلَّا نَزَلَتَ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّكِينَةِ Except that the imminence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, peace and serenity and tranquility from Allah descends upon these people, number one. Number two, وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ rahma. It is the mercy of Allah that doesn't just come towards them and is not just focused towards them, but rather وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ rahma. It is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that envelopes these people, number two. Number three, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa says, وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ These people are so special that they are reading the book of Allah, they are studying the book of Allah, وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ That the angels of Allah, they seek permission from Allah to come and attend such gatherings and to look at these people that are sitting in such gatherings. Number three, if that was not enough, number four, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa says, وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهِ By name, all of those participants, participants in such gatherings, Allah remembers them by their names and speaks about them and boasts of them to his angels. And Allah says that, see these people, despite having other occupations, doing many other things with their time, they're reading my book and they're studying my book. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us this, this uh, immense reward that is promised by the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyway, yesterday we began, we began the first uh, session out of these many sessions inshallah. We spoke about the, first we spoke about our approach towards the Qur'an. What should be our attitude when studying the Qur'an in order to maximize and get the full benefit out of the guidance of the Qur'an, number one. Number two, we spoke about some introductory and some preliminary points uh, to keep in mind when studying the Qur'an. We spoke about the Qur'an that was revealed on the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It wasn't revealed all together at once. It was revealed, you know, piecemeal, over time, gradually, intermittently, over a period of 23 years. The prophetic career of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If Allah so wished, like he did with other scriptures, he could have revealed it all at once. But Allah revealed it munajjaman, over time, gradually, over 23 years. The reason for this is because this Qur'an came as, came as a great revolutionary text. And usually, as is the case with major revolutions, it doesn't occur overnight. It takes time. Especially if the, especially if the revolution is great. And it's going to have an everlasting impact and effect. To understand the consequence and the revolutionary nature of the Qur'an, a beautiful way to, to, to put the impact and the consequence of the Qur'an is that the Qur'an is a revelation from the sky that created and caused a revolution on the earth. And that's exactly what the Qur'an did. A great scholar... Shah Waliullah Dehlawi, a revolutionary figure from the subcontinent, he died in the year 1762. He's authored a little text and a treatise on the principles of Quranic hermeneutics and Quranic tafsir. He says, what's the purpose of the Quran? He says there's three purposes. Why did Allah reveal the Quran? There's three reasons. And he cites three reasons. Reason number one, he says, is, reason number one, he says, is, tahdibu nufus al-bashar. It's to refine and it's to reform and it's to improve and to guide human being, to guide humanity in its entirety. That's number one. Number two, he says, Damghul Aqaidil Batila. It's there to refute and to re- reject obfuscations, baseless and absurd thoughts and ideas and beliefs. Number two. And number three, importantly, he says that Allah revealed the Quran. Why? Nafyul Amal il Fasida. To, to reject and to repudiate and to correct, uh, you know, absurd 
and incorrect and corrupt deeds. These are the three reasons, the three main purposes for Allah revealing the Quran. A great scholar from the subcontinent, Mawlana Ahmed Ali Lahori, rahmatullahi alayhi. He spent many years, many decades in studying the Quran and in teaching the Quran, in, in, uh, you know, in teaching the Quran, in imparting the knowledge and the guidance of the Quran. So someone came up to him and someone said, said to him, listen, you know, you spend so much of time reading the Quran, analyzing the Quran, assessing the Quran, teaching the Quran. If you could summarize the Quran, how would you summarize the Quran? In a very succinct manner, how would you summarize the Quran? So he says, I can summarize the Quran in three points. I've read the entire Quran multiple times. I've studied it. I've memorized it. I've taught it as well. Uh, he's written commentaries on the Quran as well. He says, I can summarize the entire Quran in three messages, three points. Number one, he says, the obedience of Allah, the, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ibadatullah. The Quran teaches us to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's our ultimate purpose, the purpose of our creation. Why did Allah create us? Number one, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, ita'atul rasul and itiba'ul rasul. Number two, to obey the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, obedience of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, number three, serving and servitude to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That in essence is the message of the entire Quran. Worship Allah, obey the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and serve the people around you. Be kind to the people around you. He says, in essence, that's the message of the entire Quran. Obviously, there's much more to the Quran, uh, but then this is his, uh, his way of assessing and his way of summarizing the, uh, the Quran. Yesterday, we discussed Surah Al-Fatiha. Today, inshallah, my aim is to discuss uh, at least the first juz. We would not be able to complete Surah Al-Baqarah. It's a very lengthy surah. In fact, it's the longest and the lengthiest surah in the Quran. In terms of uh, chronological order of the entire Quran, it occupies close to one-twelfth of the entire Quranic text. That's how long uh, Surah Al-Baqarah is. Uh, Mainly, there's many things, many themes, many topics, many subjects that are discussed in, in, uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah from, you know, ranging from theology to legal matters to law to um, cosmology to spiritual life uh, and so on. But we'll just focus on some of these, uh, some of these points. As we said, <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins Surah Al-Baqarah by speaking about the authenticity of the Qur'an. And in fact, he begins the Qur'an by speaking about the author, who is the author of the Qur'an. And thereafter, he commences Surah Al-Baqarah by speaking about the authenticity of the Qur'an. So there's no doubt. There's absolutely no doubt in accepting the message of the Qur'an. And obviously Allah, you know, this theme is recurring later on in Surah Al-Baqarah as well. After a few verses, Allah speaks about the authenticity and the veracity of the Qur'an again. But anyway, at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah categorizes his creation into into certain groups, certain categories in terms of faith. So there's two camps. Initially, there's two camps. Those who believe, the mu'minun, and those who disbelieve. Believe and disbelieve in what? Those who accept the Qur'an, the mu'minun, and those who reject the Qur'an. As far as those who accept the Qur'an, and those who believe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, few verses Allah says, at the end He says, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَىٰ هُدَمِّ رَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ These people are surely on guidance. If you accept the Quran, you believe in the Quran, these people are on guidance. And not just on guidance, وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And these people are successful both in this earthly life and more importantly in the permanent, uh, everlasting uh, abode in the hereafter. These are the successful individuals. Then the, the discussion shifts from the believers to the disbelievers. As far as the disbelievers are concerned, as we said yesterday, there are a few categories amongst the disbelievers as well. Those that are open those who disbelieve openly, reject openly, the kafirun. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again a few verses, and Allah says about these people, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ These people, whether you want them, or whether you don't want them, whether you give them the Qur'an, or whether you don't give them the Qur'an, whether guidance comes to them, or guidance doesn't come to them, سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ It is equal. لا يؤمنون. These people are not going to believe. Why aren't they going to believe? ختم الله على قلوبهم وعلى سمعهم وعلى أبصارهم غشاوة. It is because the three main important faculties to receive guidance, they have blocked this off themselves. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sealed it for them. They were not open. A good example to understand this is, we're in a room. You know, there's a room, a large room. And uh, it's bright daylight outside, noon, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 1 p.m. It's bright outside, it's hot outside, the sun is shining, it's rays are strong. But there's people in a room and they close the curtains and they say it's dark, there's no light outside. It is their fault. This is what these disbelievers are doing. Allah says this is exactly the guidance is in front of them. The Quran is in front of them. The speech of Allah is in front of them. The teachings of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi is in front of them. But they themselves choose to block themselves off from the message. And because they themselves have chosen to block themselves off from the message, therefore Allah has decided that la yu'minu, these people are not going to believe. Full stop. These are the open disbelievers. Then Allah speaks about those that are even more dangerous than the kuffar and even more dangerous than the disbelievers. And we spoke about this yesterday as well. And these are the hypocrites, the munafiqoon. 
Allah says about the hypocrites, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ Because they are two-faced. They show you one face, and outside behind your back they have another face. They're hypocritical. Okay, They have one narrative with you, and against you they have another narrative. They have another agenda against you. Allah says these people are so terrible in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they deserve nothing but not just hellfire, they deserve the lowest part of hellfire where it is the hottest. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Allah says about these people, Summun bukmun umyun fahum la yarji'un. These people are deaf. Summun, bukmun, they mute and they dumb. Umyun, they blind. فَهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ These individuals are never going to return to the truth. In another place in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, لَا يَعْقِلُونَ These people are never going to comprehend. There's no intellect. These are not visually impaired or deaf or have some physical ailment or illness which prevents them from listening and from seeing and from comprehending and from speaking. No, in fact, they have, they can see. They can hear, they can speak. But what Allah is speaking about here is they are deaf from the guidance. They don't listen to the guidance. لا تسمعوا لهذا القرآن والغو فيه لعلكم تغلبون When the Quran is recited to them and when the guidance is brought to them, then they say make noise, make some noise. So people cannot listen to this message. People cannot listen to the Quran. So they, they block their ears off from listening to guidance. They blind, they block themselves up from seeing guidance. They can see it, it's vivid, it's emphatic in front of them. But they choose to be blind. And they mute and they dumb because they do not speak the truth. It hurts them. They cannot speak the truth. And let alone speaking the truth, they can't even listen to the truth. So let us not be like this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. After the discussion of the hypocrite, hypocrites and the, the, the believers and the disbelievers and the two camps within the disbelievers, thereafter Allah moves and Allah speaks about the first command in the Qur'an. Chronologically, the first command in the Qur'an. And Allah doesn't specify this command for the believers, for you and I. In fact, this is a universal command. Allah doesn't say, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu believers. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal nas. Oh people, because the Qur'an is not just for believers. The Qur'an is for everyone. It's a book of guidance for everyone. Ya ayyuhal nas, oh people. And what is Allah saying? The first command in the Qur'an, what is Allah saying? U'budu rabbakum, worship your Lord. That is all Allah is asking from you. Allah doesn't want your wealth. Allah doesn't want your resources. Allah doesn't want anything from you. In fact, it is Allah who gives you wealth. It is Allah who gives you sustenance. All Allah wants from you is ibadah. Your servitude and your faithfulness and your loyalty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. U'budu rabbakum. Allah says in, later on in the Quran, in Surah Al-Dhariyat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the purpose for creating us. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ There's only one purpose for Allah creating us. I have not created jinn kind, no mankind except that they worship me. The ibadah and the servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah gives some reasons why we should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. He says the, the, the air that you breathe, the sky is above you, which, which serves as a canopy above you. And the earth that Allah has spread out in front of you, the water and the rain that Allah uh, descends down on you and pours down on you. For all of these reasons, Allah has created you. He's your creator. How can you not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again speaks about the authenticity and the veracity of the Quran. And Allah says that if you are, firstly, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ لَا At the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah has established there's absolutely no doubt in the Quran. No doubt in the Quran. Later on, in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there's no doubt in the Qur'an, but perhaps there might be doubts in your minds. You might have doubts. And Allah says, if you have any doubts as far as the Qur'an is concerned, then easy, bring something like the Qur'an. Bring something better than the Qur'an. If you can't bring something better than the Qur'an, then at least produce something like the Qur'an. And Allah says, فَإِلَّمْ تَفَعَلُوا If you cannot, by the way, وَلَنْ تَفَعَلُوا You would most certainly not be able to do. Even if you get yourselves together, all humanity in its entirety, not just humans, even non-human beings, even the jinn who are more powerful than human beings. Get everyone together, all of your resources, all of your, your intellects together, put your minds, the think tanks together, and try producing something just like one eye. One ayah, one surah of the Qur'an, you will not be able to do. And Allah says, by the way, keep this in mind, أُعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ Allah has, Allah has safeguarded and Allah has kept a, a painful punishment, which is the hellfire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for individuals who doubt the Qur'an and for individuals who reject and for individuals who deny the Qur'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says this fire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so powerful that the fuel, the fuel of your fire might be charcoal. But Allah says the fuel of the fire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ It is nothing but stones and rocks and human flesh, human beings, human corpses, human bodies. This is what keeps the fire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala burning and ignited. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta protect us. What we need to understand is, 
Allah, whenever Allah subhanahu, this is the beauty of the Quran and the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever Allah speaks about punishments, immediately after that, Allah speaks about His mercy. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about hellfire in the Quran, immediately after that, Allah speaks about Jannah. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticizes a certain group of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then praise these individuals. This is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wherever credit is due, Allah will acknowledge credit. Allah will give credit, wherever it's due. So likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the fire. May Allah forgive us and may Allah protect us from this fire. Immediately after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ That give glad tidings, give good news of such gardens beneath which flow streams for individuals who believe in Allah and don't just believe but also couple their belief with good deeds, a'mal saliha, with good deeds. Allah says, give them glad tidings of the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beneath which uh, flow the streams of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says, in Jannah these individuals would be given fruits. They'll be given, Allah gives an example of one of the delights of Jannah. There's many delights of Jannah, many pleasures of Jannah. But Allah says when they would be given fruits, the fruits of Jannah, then they would say, min qabl. They would say, we've been given, this, this looks very familiar, we've seen this before. Why would they say this? Because Allah will give them pomegranates. Allah would give them, for example, Allah will give them fruits that they thought they have eaten in this world. However, the reason why they would say we've been given this is because they saw these fruits in the world. But when they taste this, then they would say that we've never seen and we've never tasted anything like this. The scholars, of the interpreters and the commentators of the Qur'an say, why would Allah give them fruits of Jannah, which is far more superior, you know, they say class A fruits, you know, far more superior than the fruits of this world. But why would Allah give it in the shape of the fruits of this world? The reason for this is, and I'm sure you would agree with me, if you are invited for a meal, this happens to me, I'm sure it happens to you as well. Someone's invited you, your friend, your colleague, you went for a dinner. And there's food that's placed in front of you, perhaps from another culture. You haven't seen before, you don't know what to do. You're in two minds. Shall I eat it or not? Even if I do eat it, how do I eat it? What if I eat it in the incorrect manner? What do I do? You're a bit appreh- apprehensive. Jannah is such a place that لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون لا غم ولا حزن Jannah is such a place where they, let alone the punishment of Allah, let alone sickness, let alone problems and difficulties, Allah would not even want you to, for a moment to even be apprehensive like this. That what if, what if I don't know what this is? No, no, no. Allah says, I will give you fruits that you have seen, but they will be far more better than those fruits. In a hadith Qudsi, the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh, is the narrator of the hadith. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yaqul Allah ta'ala, the Messenger Sassim says that Allah says, Yaqul Allah ta'ala, A'dadtu li'ibadi as-salihin ma la aynun ra'at wa la udhunun sami'at wa la khatara ala qalbi bashar. Thumma qara'a fala ta'lamu nafsum ma ukhfiya lahum min qurrati a'yun jaza'an bima kanu ya'malun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have kept and I have, I have preserved, I have in store, and I have prepared for my righteous servants. What I have prepared for them? Ma la aynun ra'at. That which no eye has seen. Wala udhunun sami'at. That which no ear has heard. Wala khatara ala qalbi bashar. And that which has not passed the thought and the conception of which has not passed and crossed the mind of any human being. What we hear about Jannah and read about Jannah in the Quran and in the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa this is just a description. This is just a description, but Allah says, no eye has seen, no ears have heard, and the thought has not even crossed the mind of any human being. This is the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa used to say, when you ask Allah for his Jannah, فَسَلُوا اللَّهَ الْفِرْدَوْسِ Don't just ask Allah for Jannah, but ask Allah for the highest stage of Jannah, which is Al-Firdaus. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa describes Al-Firdaus, the highest stage of Jannah. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa says, سَقْفُهُ عَرْشُ الرَّحْمَانِ The throne of Al-Firdaus is the, 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 the roof of Al-Firdaus is the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah give us place and abode in the Firdaus close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about another category of individuals. Sorry, before we get to this. Thereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the creation, the inception of human beings, humankind, the human race, the genesis, Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, the creation of Adam. And then Allah speaks about how he was, how he was sent out of paradise and out of, how he was sent out of Jannah because of the trickery and the deception of shaitan and Satan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us that listen, we've told you the categories of people, the good, and then we told you the disbelievers and the groups within the disbelievers, the worst of whom are the hypocrites, they, you have another enemy, and that is shaitan. That is shaitan. He is your open enemy. If he deceived your father, and if he was successful, if he was successful in taking your father out of Jannah, do you think he will rest and he will keep away from you? 
he will deceive you even more. And Allah says, keep in mind, in, in the huwa aduwum mubin, that he is your open enemy. From day one, he is your open enemy. The Messenger Allah in a hadith, he says, that whenever a child is born, whenever a child is born, whenever the child comes out of the womb of the mother, and the child cries, the doctors and the physicians and the gynecologists might give you a reason why they're crying. But the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, the reason the child cries is because مَسَّهُ shaitan, Because shaitan pokes this child and shaitan says to this child that I am your enemy and I will meet you in this world soon. From day one, shaitan tells you that I am your enemy. So Allah says that shaitan is your open enemy. Do not fall into the traps of shaitan. He took your father Adam out of Jannah. And his very aim is to take you out of Jannah. When Allah told shaitan to bow and to prostrate in front of Adam, what did shaitan, shay, all of the angels prostrated, but shaitan refused to prostrate. And Allah asked shaitan, ma mana'aka an la tasjud. What prevented you from, from prostrating to Adam? When this is my command, the command of your creator, the command of Allah. What did shaitan say? Khalaqtahu min, khalaqt, خَلَقْتَنِي مِن نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِن طِينٍ That you created me from fire, from fire and you created him from dirt and from clay. In other words, I am more superior than him. How can a superior being prostrate to an inferior being? This is the logic of shaitan. This is the logic of shaitan. When Adam knew he erred and he made a mistake, immediately he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he repented. فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِن رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ Immediately he humbled himself and he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But look at shaitan. When he made a mistake, he knew he made a mistake, but he was adamant and he was proud and he was arrogant. And this is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not tolerate. If we make mistakes, the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. But if we are adamant and we insist on, on erring and challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially pride, the first crime that was committed against Allah is, is pride and arrogance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about pride, the hadith in Sahih Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الْكِبْرُ رِدَائِي وَالْعَظَمَةُ إِزَارِي فَمَنْ نَازَعَنِي فِيهِمَا أَوْ فِي أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمَا قَصَمْتُهُ وَأَلْقَيْتُهُ فِي النَّارِ Pride and arrogance, this belongs solely to me. This is my prerogative. This only belongs to me. Whoever tries to take pride away from me, whoever expresses any pride or any arrogance, قَصَمْتُهُ I will break this person's back and I will throw him headlong in, head, headlong in the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. After speaking about Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah then, and, and shaitan, Allah then speaks about another category of individuals. And this is one civilization from the previous civilizations, the Banu Israel, the children of Israel. Israel was Ya'qub alayhi salatu wasalam, the Israelites. And why Allah, you know, there's a significant portion of Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the Banu Israel. Allah speaks about his favors. Ya Bani Israel, adhkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum. Multiple times. Ya Bani Israel, adhkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum. Oh, oh, the children of Israel, you know, keep in mind, remember my favors, remember my bounties upon you. Remember this, remember this, remember this. So many favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any request they had, Allah immediately gave them. In fact, Allah was so kind to the Banu Israel that at times they made such requests that, that, that are usually outside the norm, that are usually not normal. Allah would not normally do. They asked for miracles and Allah instantly gave them the miracles. They asked for food and drink from Jannah and instantly Allah gave them food and drink in Jannah. They asked for the oceans to be split. Immediately in front of them, they saw the ocean splitting. They asked for this, they asked for Allah gave them. Allah gave them whatever they wanted. But despite the more Allah gave them, the more Allah gave them, the more they turned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more rebellious they became against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look at some of the absurd and preposterous demands they gave. And they made to the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To Musa alayhi salatu salam for instance. We all know the story of the sacrificial cow. Right? The, the story of the baqarah and the cow. The reason why the surah is named surah al-baqarah. There was a murder and Allah uh, told Musa that tell them to slaughter a cow. And Musa said to them slaughter a cow. And then they began asking. They could have just taken any cow and slaughtered it. It would have been sufficient. But they started asking what type of cow, how old, what color, where we go. All of these unnecessary questions they began asking the prophet of Allah. They began debating with the prophet of Allah as though he was one amongst them. Okay, they, they, they did not, they lacked the respect of the Prophet of, of, of Allah Musa alayhi salatu salam. When we hear about this, we frown and we say how foolish the Banu Israel were. How foolish. How foolish the Banu Israel were. But let me ask you a question. If Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was alive today and he was in my midst and in your presence and if he said to you leave interest, if he says to you pray your five daily salah, if he says to you give your zakah, if he says to you be kind to your family, 
Be kind to the people around you. How many of us would listen to the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam? This is precisely what the Banu Israel did to their prophets, and this is precisely what we are doing to our Prophet, who was greater than Musa alaihi salatu wasallam. The reason these stories are mentioned in the Quran, and I will end with this: the reason Allah gives us these tales of Banu Israel and Ad and Thamud and all of these people in the Quran is not to entertain us. It's not to entertain us. The reason is so we don't fall into the same mistakes that these people made. And what was the outcome of these people? I will end with this. Allah says the outcome of the rebellion of these, of these people was ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكْ Their hearts were hardened. Allah made their hearts so hard that He made it harder than rocks. And Allah says it's, it's an embarrassment to even give this analogy of comparing their hearts to rocks because there are some rocks which are beneficial. There are streams of water that gush through some rocks which, which provide nourishment and benefit people around them. But these individuals, their hearts are so hard that it is impossible for them to believe and to look at the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to practice on and, and to learn the lessons from the Quran. وصلى الله عليه وسلم على محمد. وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين